Listen, Brent, you didn't see Haley's Comet in 2007. Be reasonable. It was Comet McNaught. Honestly, it's kind of difficult to explain how upsetting seeing something that shouldn't be in the night sky is. Think about constellations, for example. Orion is always chasing a bull, and he's always stepping on a bunny, and he's always being followed by his trusty dog. So a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, people looked up in the night sky and they went, this is the constellation. This, these are the stars. This is how they move. And year after year after year, they looked the same. Even things like planets are predictable. You know that Mars is going to have a certain path in the night sky because Mars always has the same path in the night sky. And once you figure out what that path is, it's no longer this unpredictable, weird phenomenon. Contrast that with comets. Comets seemingly come out of nowhere. They're not very predictable. Pretty much the earliest illustrations of comets come from China because of course they do. One of the most interesting records comes from the artifact discovered in the Mawangdi tomb dated to the Han Dynasty, where archeologists found comets illustrated on silk and their corresponding explanations. This is not the oldest record of comets, but it is the oldest illustration with descriptions that we have of comets. And those descriptions, by the way, are all predictive. Now, not all the comets are bad, but most of them are bad. You got war, death, disease, grief, war, famine, more war, good crops, but internal war. Battles in specific places, and uh, yeah, more war. <laughs> I'm sensing a batter. And the length of the tail was supposed to indicate the severity of the doom. Now these doomy predictions aside, they didn't just say, we saw a comet. They said, here's this comet. Here's how bright it is. Here's how long the tail is. Here's where it was. Here's what constellation it passed through, which is why historians can now look back and say, oh, look at that. They probably saw Halley's Comet in China at this time. Now, the Greeks also thought the comets were pretty doomy and gloomy, but looking back at that silk book, during that time, the Chinese and the Greeks, they didn't have any connection. So they probably arrived at this idea that comets were bad independently. Every society on Earth has done astronomy, and it turns out that in most places that we have a record of, comets were considered bad. For example, an account published in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage found that out of 25 geographically varied Native Australian reports on comets seen between 1843 and 1927, only two reports featured comets as being remotely good. The other 23 accounts painted comets as omens of sickness, death, evil, and the Ulei of New South Wales saw comets possibly as terrestrial phenomena that could take the rain out of clouds. Comets causing drought was a weirdly common belief. Seeing comets as an omen of doom was actually pretty popular the world over, but it's not fair to say that no society ever saw comets as good. For example, in India, some groups of people, such as the Banjara and Kolam, thought of comets as predictive, sure, but not always a bad omen. Could be a good omen, could be a bad omen, could go either way. But other groups in India, notably the Gond people, saw comets as an actively good sign that the bad things humans had done was going to be swept away. So comets weren't always and everywhere seen as bad, but a lot of people thought of them as bad omens, and this was definitely true for the Greeks. For example, Homer in the Iliad wrote on the helmet of Achilles, like the red star that from his flaming hair shakes down diseases, pestilence, and war. Aristotle had issues with comets too, but it's really the later sources that solidified comets and their celestial consequences. So let's talk about Pliny the Elder. This guy decided to give a description of everything that is known to exist on Earth. Oh, is that all? His work, Natural History, takes up 37 volumes and covers tens of thousands of topics. He wrote that comets had 10 types. We have Pagonius, a comet with a beard, hanging from its lower part, Xiphius, pointy like a dagger, Lampadius, appearing as a burning torch. You get it. And Pliny did dedicate way too much space to the predictions of the disasters that comets would cause. Pliny was killed by Mount Vesuvius, not because he lived in Pompeii, but because he sailed over the harbor to see what all the hubbub was about. Either that or he died of a heart attack on the way. But probably his fear of missing out did actually affect his death. Kids these days. So Pliny didn't help the cause of comets, but we can't contribute the fear that later infested Europe around comets directly to Pliny. That honor goes to Ptolemy. Kind of. 
Claudius Ptolemy lived from about 100 to 170 AD and was extremely influential on astronomy well into the 1500s. He's known for the Almagest, which was way more popular than anything Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking, or Neil deGrasse Tyson have ever written. So the Almagest is what Ptolemy is famous for writing, but he also wrote the Tetrabiblos, and later the Tetrabiblos had the Centiloquium attached to it. And this is where things get really fuzzy. The Centiloquium is 100 rules specifically for predictions. Rules such as, if the comet's direction moves west to east, a foreign foe will invade the country, and if the comet remains stationary, then the foe is domestic. Here's the rub. Modern historians don't think that Ptolemy wrote the Centiloquium. It's a fake. While the Centiloquium is often attached to the Tetrabiblos, which Ptolemy did write, the first time it was attached to that book was 700 years after Ptolemy died. Let's be honest, if you were trying to sell an original Ptolemy to some king somewhere, and you wanted to attach your commentary predictions, why not attach Ptolemy's name to it? He's famous. People... People haven't changed. Anyway, Ptolemy's 100 rules for comets and their bad predictions became extremely influential in the Middle Ages. And this is where things get really crazy. So there's this area between the Romans and the early 1600s that most people don't think of as good. There's a lot of reasons why the Middle Ages aren't a time traveler's dream destination. But one of them is that Europeans got really religious and started tying everything back to God. Religious philosophers, so like anyone with an opinion at the time, went back and forth on whether comets were brought in by God or the devil, or they were causes of sin or the consequences of sin. But one thing they seemed to agree on was that they weren't good. Bede the Venerable of Yarrow stated that comets portend changes of rule, pestilence, wars, winds, and heat. Thomas Aquinas did nothing to assuage the considerable fear of comets, but wrote that they were among the 15 signs preceding the Lord's coming to judgment. But you know what? It was the 1200s. What do you expect? Let's jump forward a little bit. Oh, here we go. The Nuremberg Chronicle. A great comet appeared in the month of January, 1472. It was flame-colored and had a black tail. It proceeded westward but veered to the north. It was seen for 80 days, and before it vanished, another comet with a fiery tail appeared, proceeding eastward. Then followed an unprecedented drought, and later the plague broke out in a number of places, and there arose many dissensions, revolts, and cruel wars. So comets, bad. Martin Luther went even further and said that comets are harlot stars. He is quoted as saying, The heathen write that the comet may arise from natural causes, but God creates not one that does not foretoken a sure calamity. So now we're up to God is throwing comets at us. Great. Roger Bacon, sort of famous in astronomical history for his use of optics, observed a comet in 1264 appear in Cancer and move towards Mars, which he went on to proclaim presaged discord and wars. Even scientists in the late 1500s but early 1600s were taken in by comets of doom. Michael Maestlin, mentor of Johannes Kepler, believed the origin of comets was a mystery known only to God, but once created they were indeed celestial phenomenon, and he was right about that. However, he believed that the comet of 1577, though celestial, was still a portent of doom and proclaimed that it would bring peace, but a peace purchased only by a bloody victory. Tycho Brahe also studied the 1577 comet and made accurate, for the time, predictions about its distance to Earth. But then he spent fully half his treatise talking about the astrological predictions of the comet, which he decided would bring death. A year after the 1577 comet comes my absolute favorite moral fight over a comet. It comes from Andreas Silicius in his 1578 book, The Theological Reminder of the New Comet, in which he writes, The thick smoke of human sins rising every day, every hour, every moment full of stench and horror before the face of God and becoming gradually so thick as to form a comet with curled and plated tresses, which at last is kindled by the hot and fiery anger of the supreme heavenly judge. Real quick, with curled and plated tresses, is this man slut shaming a comet? By far, this is my favorite quote about a comet of all time. 
this is the Doctor Who episode that I need. Not running back and seeing Shakespeare one more time. Just the sins and the comet and the curled and plated dresses. Calm down, Salikiest. Now, to be fair, it's 1578, but also it's 1578. And the best comeback of all time comes the next year in 1579 by one Andreas Duddeth, who said, If comets are composed of human sin, they would never be absent from the sky, which is the best internet comeback of all time. You might think that by the time we get to Kepler, people have let this stuff go, but no. Kepler, right as he was about planetary orbits, was bonker balls. He honestly thought that when comets were created, there was this special spirit that was created by God to guide the comet. He also thought that the comet and the spirit, when they dissipated, they dissipated together. So he kind of took the astrological doom and gloom into the realm of science? He said that if Earth came into contact with a tail, the atmosphere would become impure and a ton of people would die. In Kepler's 1619 essay, De Cometis Libelli Tress, he not only talked about the physical nature of comets, on which he said a bunch of wrong things, but also talked about their astrological significance. So you might be thinking, sure, but that's Maislin and Bra and Kepler. That's the beginning of the scientific revolution. By the end of the 1600s, surely people have moved on. Maybe. Maybe comets could have shaken their bad reputation by the end of the 1600s, except that two comets came in 1664 and 1665. And so did the plague. So in this case, the Comet of Doom idea kind of made sense, because in 1664 there was a bright comet, and in 1665, one in five Londoners died from the Black Plague. And then a year after that, there was the Great London Fire. Even Daniel Defoe of Lost in Space fame, I mean, Swiss Family Robinson, I mean, Robinson Crusoe, I mean, the Martian, wrote about the comet moving across the sky, that it portended a heavy judgment, slow but severe, terrible and frightful, as the plague. So comets couldn't shake their bad reputation, and they also couldn't shake astrology. But it's important to note that that doesn't mean that astrologers were correct. For example, John Gadbury, astrologer, wrote a treatise called De Cometis in 1665 in which he laid out the zodiac and said that if a comet arose in one sign, it would bring about certain events. So Gadbury basically said if a comet arises in this one zodiacal sign, this is what will happen, right? A comet that arises in Taurus portends diseases, and comets that arise in Aries portends sickness disease and sickness are the same, but whatever. Only a few of Gadbury's comets have no pestilence, no disease, and no death. Comets, he said, arising in Virgo or Capricorn should portend scandals and fornication. And guess where the comets of 1664 and 1665 arose in? Yeah, if Gadbury had been correct, everyone in London should have been in the Roaring Twenties, but instead, they were busy losing their skin. Eventually, People let the astrology of comets go, but did they let the doom go? Not a chance. Even Edmund Haley of Haley's Comet fame fell victim to the doom train. And this was the late 1600s, okay? The Dutch were figuring out early engines, England was being co-run by a woman, the Americans were burning witches. Okay, I wasn't all progressive. And what did Edmund Haley think of comets? Well, besides making some very nice predictions, in 1694, he went in front of the Royal Society in England and told them that Noah's flood was caused by a comet. Science! Two years after Haley's proposed cometary deluge, William Whiston, in a book published in 1696, took Haley's suggestion a step further and said that the comet caused a tidal break in Earth's surface, allowing subterranean waters to rise up and start the deluge, Noah's flood. Science! He also predicted the end of the world via a comet, saying that a comet would come in and alter Earth's orbit and fling it into the sun. And when is the end of the world? 2255. Oh man, that's before humans get to go back in time and save the whales! We are so screwed. And if you haven't heard of William Whiston, you have heard of his job. He replaced 
Sir Isaac Newton as the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge University. So you might expect that the scariest comets of all time would come from the Middle Ages or from the Greeks or the Romans, but actually I would say a good case can be made for Halley's Comet 1910 being the scariest comet of all time. By 1910, scientists around the world generally understood that comets weren't dangerous, but widespread public opinion hadn't caught up. Also, spectroscopy, a way to determine what elements or molecules the distant object possesses by essentially splitting light, was becoming the biggest tool in astronomy at the turn of the century, and scientists found out that good old Halley's Comet had toxic cyanogen gas in its tail. You know, like cyanide. So this combination of legitimate scientific eyebrow raising at the comet's tail and people's long-held suspicion of comets as bringers of doom meant that Halley 1910 was feared almost worldwide. Newspaper reports from China suggested that people were afraid they would be killed and that the comet might poison the water. In Croatia, France, and Austria-Hungary, people sold their possessions in preparation for a short but happy rest of their lives. In Malta, there was a successful press campaign to reassure the public that the comet wouldn't harm them. But in Rome, Pope Pius X had to denounce the hoarding of oxygen cylinders, and there were people that bought and sold anti-comet tail pills. Similar stories came out out of the United States, Russia, England, which is understandable since King Edward VII did in fact die about a month before Haley reached naked eye visibility. Couldn't have been his constant smoking. <laughs> it was the comet. So possibly the scariest comet of all time was Haley's Comet even just a century ago. But hopefully that was the last major comet that was seen as a comet of doom, a harbinger of death. Join me next time for a tour of experts everywhere asking, but what even are comets really? It's good to be a geek. It's good to be unseen. It's good to watch the rabbit on a black screen. So back to doom. I just saw Comet McNutt, it doesn't sound as cool as Haley's Comet. So if you think, so what, uh, how do I sound like a teenager? His voice is changing. And why am I so sweaty under my lips? I've only recorded this three times. This is by far my favorite quote. Quote, quote is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, that's the word. <laughs> can't actually see that. <laughs> uh, is my microphone working?